What's up, everyone? I'm here with Dr. Richard Byrne, our local airway guru here at the Cooper Medical School Simulation Center. And Rich, we were talking about some airway stuff. What exactly are we talking about? First of all, I don't know what you mean by guru, okay? I don't really know what that term means, but I'm willing to accept it. He paid me a couple extra bucks to say guru, so he's being humble right now. I don't now. get to paid any extra bucks for being the guru, though. That's <laughs> big. That's fair. Yeah, so Haney, uh, what I've got for you today are four tips with video laryngoscopy using a hyperangulated blade. Okay. Can you just, before we go on, hyperangulate, because people always say video, and sometimes you get a hyperangulated, sometimes you get a standard geometry. We should just clear up that nomenclature yeah. right now. When, the, when we got our first video laryngoscope, which happened to be the GlideScope, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, yeah. they don't pay me any money for anything, just to throw that out there. I mean, right. I would take it. Yeah. If they offered, I'd cash that check right away, but they don't. They okay. don't. Anyway, when that first came out, what we had was one type of blade. This is the hyperangulated blade. It's it's uh, it's got a very deep curve to it to facilitate intubation of difficult airways, and that's all we had for a long time. But now we have, are really spoiled for choice because now most manufacturers of video laryngoscopes will have two options: the hyperangulated blade and what we call a standard geometry blade. This is just a regular regular old Mac blade. Hold it up side by side, same profile from the back, same curvature. Same size. Yeah, and, and for a while, people would say the GlideScope, and what they meant by default is hyperangulated, but GlideScope makes standard geometry. So it's really important, especially if you have someone who's fetching things for you in the department who's not familiar with things, that you say, I need the hyperangulated video laryngoscope, or I need the standard geometry. And if they don't know, then just explain it to them. But the last thing you want is in the middle of an airway calling for the video, you get the wrong thing. And the distinction is very important because the techniques are very different. And after teaching, I don't know, about 150 residents how to intubate using video laryngoscopy, what I'll say is the techniques for using the standard geometry MAC blade and hyperangulated blade get mixed up all the time. And what you usually get is some sort of a mixture of the two. Mm. Now, the video laryngoscopes are usually very forgiving, uh, and you can use poor technique, and you'll probably still get it in first pass success, but it is really important to do it right and practice it right every time. Because when you're confronted with that really difficult airway, uh, better technique equals better chance for first pass success equals less chance of all the things we care about. Aspiration, critical desaturation, cardiac arrest. Right. Okay, well then let's, uh, let's talk about the technique for hyperangulated. Let's blade. dive in. I've got four tips for you, Haney. Four easy to remember tips. The first tip I have for you, and this seems very basic, but I see it go wrong a lot, is to remember to look at the patient's mouth when you're putting things in the patient's mouth. Wait a minute, wait. You have to look at your patient when you're doing procedures. Yeah. This is groundbreaking. Yeah, so look at the patient's mouth when you're putting the blade or the tube in, and then look up at the screen when you're manipulating the blade or the tube. So first step is to look at the patient's mouth and put the blade in the patient's mouth while you're looking at the patient. Then look up at the screen to get your view. There's a good view right there. Then look back at the patient when you're inserting the tube, and then look back up at the screen to uh, deliver the tube, okay? And if you don't do that, the problem that I'll see sometimes is that you're looking up at the screen, you have the tube and you're trying to put it in the patient's mouth, but really what you're doing is jabbing that rigid stylet into the patient's eyeball, which is too soft and squishy. Not meant to, not meant to take an ET tube, you know? Now you're calling the ICU and opto. It's a double console. Oh yeah, well, yeah. you know, we gotta generate revenue somehow that's in this economy. Fair. Anyway, uh, so that's my first tip. They, they, it's jokingly referred to as the look, 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 look method. Look, 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 look. Back. Look at the patient, put the uh, blade in, yep. look up at the screen, get your view, look back at the patient, put the tube in, look back up at the screen to pass the tube. Okay, makes sense. Whatever you're doing, just look at the test that you're doing. Yes. Uh, that's, that's, uh, no poking of the eyeballs. We're blow, trying to avoid that as much as possible. Blows my mind. All right, so that's number one. What's that's number, number one. Okay. Number two uh, is uh, typically when, especially a novice, will insert this blade, they'll insert the blade very deep. Mm. It's very, it's very typical for for even for for direct laryngoscopy. The problem when you insert the GlideScope blade too deep is that what happens is the glottis takes up a huge amount of the screen. The camera is jammed in right there on the on the glottis, and then when you try to pass your ET tube, what happens is as soon as the ET tube enters your view, you lose the view of the right. glottis. Right. There's not enough room on the screen to manipulate that tube. All I can see right now is the balloon of the ET tube, and I can't watch the tip go through the glottis. Yeah, it's. I think a lot of the inertia and momentum when people get the thing, the, oh, yeah. the blade, they're just they, they just go for it. The they adrenaline's see it. pumping and they jam it in there. Exactly. They, they don't think to to readjust. Okay. So yeah. how do I fix this problem? I'm pulling the blade back, and there's two places you can put the tip of the blade with hyperangulated blade. You can go in the molecular and do a little bit of a rock, a little bit of a lift, and pop up that epiglottis, just like you would do with a Mac blade. Or, and it's very forgiving this way too, you can pick up the epiglottis and get a very similar view. But notice what I'm doing now is I'm leaving the bottom, about two thirds of the screen free to manipulate the tip of my ET tube. Okay, so divide up the screen into thirds and 
nothing should be in the top thirds. Everything you want to see is in the bottom two thirds. Yep, bottom two thirds is empty, and the glottis only takes about the top third of the screen. Gotcha. And that way, when I insert my tip of my tube, I have I can see the tip of my tube, and I can deliver it to the glottis much easier than if the glottis was taking up the entire screen. Perfect. All Great. right, that's so pretty easy. We got look, 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 look. Four looks, just four looks. Okay, it's not that looks. hard. That's what you you're said. You're a very smart guy, Haney. You know you can do this. Count to four. Got it. Got it. Then you have divide up into thirds, gloss in the top third. Gloss only in the top third. You got it. Got it. All right. All right. The third tip has to do with the type of stylet we're using. So when you're using a hyperangulated blade, you have a rigid stylet. The reason it needs to be rigid is you need to lever it around the tongue to facilitate tube delivery. It's actually um, a lever. No, it's lever. No, it's, I'm, it's I'm lever. I'm fairly certain it's lever. I agree to disagree on that one. Okay, okay so and when you're using a lever, mm -hmm. you want a long lever, right? Yeah. Because then you get more leverage. Yeah. It's pronounced leverage. It's actually pretty leverage, pretty and that's why you're using a lever. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Fair so enough. So anyway, to get the longest lever possible, take your hand and grasp the tube all the way at the top with your thumb just under the flange. Okay. Now I have a very long lever. Uh-huh. Uh, that makes it much easier to lever around the tongue. What I usually see is a uh, kind of direct laryngoscopy technique where the hand is placed low down on the tube. Yeah. And this is good for DL because you're more uh, agile and like, increases your agility. Like a pencil, right? Fine right. motor skills. For your fine motor skills to really man maneuver the tip of the tube through. This is a different technique. If you try to grab it down here and lever it around the tongue, you're losing a huge portion of your lever. You lose your mechanical advantage. You make it much more difficult to flip the tip of this tube up over the retinoids and into the glottis. He said lever six times in a row just if you're playing at home. Lever, 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 lever. <laughs> That's right. All right, so we're gonna lever this, show me how. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the patient, I'm gonna insert my blade, I'm gonna look up at the screen to get my view, I'm gonna pick up the epiglottis, because that's what third. I like to do. Top it's third. only in the top third of the screen. And then when I grasp the blade, I'm gonna grasp it up here with my, tongue, my, my uh, thumb under the flange. Yep. Don't forget to look when you're going to the patient. I will. I will. Don't okay. forget. I won't forget that, Haney. When you go to enter the uh, the patient's mouth with the with the tube, hold it like this. I'll often see people enter like this, and this is how you would do it for a direct laryngoscopy. But again, um, this is a rigid stylet, and it's pointing straight down at the tip of the tube. And so you want to hold the blade uh, tube like this, and then enter the mouth because the tip of the tube is angled straight down, and then rock it back like a lever. Okay. So I'm holding it here. I'm holding the tube parallel to the ground. Okay. I'm entering the patient's mouth with the tip of the tube. I'm looking up at the screen, and then I'm rocking it back straight back like a slot machine lever. Perfect. And that makes it very easy. Whereas if I grasp it low down and try to and try to lever it backwards, I tend to get hung up on the retinoids, mm -hmm. and that's what I see happen a lot. So if you grab it up higher, it makes it much easier to get over those retinoids and in. That's great. So look, 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 look. Then you're going to keep the glottis in the uh, top third, and then what you're going to do is you're going to keep the the tube parallel, put your thumb up at the top, and then lever it back. Like so a slot like, machine. Like a slot machine. If you just remember, like a slot machine, then you're halfway there. But many of these people are, are good people that don't spend their time in Vegas like you. I think they know like what a slot machine is, uh, Haney. Uh, not everyone's a These are very bright people, people out there. Very bright people. Okay. And my last tip I think is actually the most important, and uh, it's one that I see perform incorrectly all the time. When we're doing direct laryngoscopy, we often enter uh, the patient's mouth with the ET tube at this kind of an angle here. Okay. okay? And the reason we do that, you don't go straight in, is because if you went straight in, you would immediately block your view of the glottis. So you kind of go in from the corner of the mouth. That's what, right. that's what I was taught in front yeah. what you were taught. And then at the last second, you flip it uh, back to the midline to pass the ET tube. Right. The problem with using a hyperangulated blade uh, with the rigid stylet is that what you're forced to do if you go into the corner of the mouth is to manipulate the tube in two different planes. This one, to make the tip of the tube go left and right, and this one. I don't know, is that, that's like the sagittal and the coronal? I don't know, it's two different planes. Two planes. You're making it much more difficult on yourself. Yeah. My advice here is, after entry of the mouth, follow the curve of the blade completely. So you're following the plane of the blade like this, in one, in one plane. Don't go in at an angle like this. I'll often see 45, 30 degree angle. This makes it much more difficult unless you're really good at video games, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and there are a lot of video devices that are hyperangulated that actually have a track built in. So to uh, force you to do that, to exactly. Force you to do that, so you can't <laughs> yeah. screw that up. Yeah. Right. But if you're freehanding it like this, force yourself to follow the angle of the blade directly. Parallel. So parallel to the patient, parallel to the, it's the rule of double parallels. Sure it is. It's a parallelogram. It's the Haney rule. I'll okay, so I'm looking at the mouth, I'm putting in the blade, I'm getting my view. 
Okay, I'm inserting the, the blade parallel to the floor, the tip of the tube goes in, I'm rocking it straight back in one plane only, and it should go right in. And honestly, if you do it correctly, if you get a correct view and you follow the curve of this blade directly, you could like do this with your eyes closed, probably. You want to try it? I tried this once on camera already and it didn't work, but I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna go for it again, okay? Okay. All right, all right, I'm gonna get my view. I'm never gonna hear the end of this from my residence if I don't get it, okay. Yeah, I got my view, it's in, the, it's in the top third of the screen, the glottis is dead center in the middle, parallel to the ground. My eyes are closed, yes, we yes. can all confirm. I'm rocking it straight back, and it. It did it! He did I, it. I did it, I did it! I didn't think that was gonna work. I didn't think so either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that would be incredibly <laughs> difficult to do if you went in at a side angle and had to manipulate the tube like this, left and right, and up and down. For so, disclosure, we don't recommend that you do this with your eyes closed. Oh yeah, don't do it on an actual patient, unless it's Haney. <laughs> oh, just kidding, buddy. Great guy, great guy. I'd love to debate you someday. <laughs> All right. Okay, so those are my four tips and tricks for making a smoother, okay. uh, more successful first pass success. And honestly, first pass success is what it's all about. And we know from literature, and there was actual papers that looked at this, that if you get the tube in the first time, it's better than not getting the tube in the first time. That's what literature has shown. So literature and papers have shown it. That's yes. impressive. Oh. So we have look, look, look. <laughs> look, 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 look. Look, 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 look. Haney. Then uh, keep the glottis on the top third of the screen, parallel to the floor, and use it like a lever. lever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the Press way the tube at the top, straight back in one plane only. Right. And then the last one was the, well, keep it in the plane. That's you got it. That's okay. it. One plane only. Good. And always intubate with your eyes open. That's rule number five. Four tips for GlideScope success using the hyperangulated blade. I love it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Haney. All right. We'll see you in a sec.